Good afternoon, friends. Good afternoon, members of the Association of Surgeons of India, surgeons across, across the country, and those of you who are viewing it from outside the country, some of my patients may be viewing this, and let me welcome you to this presentation, which is on a topic which is very dear to me, I like to call it chronic venous insufficiency. A more colloquial name for this subject is varicose vein and yet another and probably an appropriate name for this malady is venous hypertension. This particular condition affects the superficial veins in our system and I shall in the next half an hour or 40 minutes or so, we'll discuss some of its pathogenesis, its etiopathogenesis, and its presentation and its treatment. I'm Professor Sandeep Kumar. I retired as Professor of Surgery from the King George's Medical University in Lucknow, having served there for about three decades. Later, I established the six aims for the Government of India, and I was the director of the All India Institute of Medical Sciences at Bhopal. I'm currently also holding the office of the Chief Editor of the Indian Journal of Surgery. And I welcome you to this webinar on venous insufficiency. Veins are channels that take the blood back to the heart. Veins, as we know in our body, are disposed as superficial veins that we all see when somebody comes and takes our blood from underneath our skin and deep veins. Deep veins do not run on the surface of the muscle. They instead run on the undersurface of the muscle close to the bone and veins often run accompanying and straddling an artery deriving the peristaltic, the, the pulsatile movement of the artery to uh, kind of uh, uh, accentuate its own blood flow towards the heart, veins differ with arteries in terms of having valves. Valves are little uh, teeny weeny uh, fleshy masses that allow the flow of the blood in one direction that is towards the heart and if it so happens that if the blood turns to return towards the periphery, the valves close shut and do not allow from this column of the blood to fall down. However, because of the wear and tear and because of some congenital abnormality or poor uh, formation of the valve, these valves may get damaged and there may be a constant reflux of the blood back into the direction in which it should not go. And this is again shown in this slide. As you can see, here is a small teeny weeny peripheral vein, which is coming and is a tributary vein to this major vein. And this major vein, let's call it a great saphenous vein, is actually draining from here into a deeper system, let's say cephalofemoral junction into the femoral vein in the groin. And this portion, the vortex, as you see the blood comes, in the, in the person is in the standing position. When the muscle is contracted, the valves are closed. Once the valves are closed, there is no hypertension that is uh, kind of communicated to the vein below. However, if this valve is incompetent, even if the muscle is contracting and the blood is leaking, there will be venous hypertension. This shows how normally the blood flows. As you see, once the skeletal muscle is contracted, the blood is flowing in this direction. Once the skeletal muscle is relaxed, the valve gets open, and the higher blood pressure in the peripheral veins actually uh, um, um, make the blood flow in the direction towards the deeper vein and towards the heart. This is the same thing being shown here. As you can see, this is the normal deep vein, let us say femoral vein or popliteal vein. This is the superficial vein. 
and these are the defective valves that you can see and this is the blood which is refluxing from the deep vein system into the superficial vein system leading to more, more prominently dilated superficial vein tortuous or varicose superficial vein and there will be at the end of it a leaking superficial vein or small venules will be leaking the same thing is shown here as you know the veins have valves there is another structure that connects the superficial vein to the deep vein and this structure is known as perforating vein most perforating veins that perforate the deep fascia that perforate the muscle take the blood from the superficial vein into the deep vein have valve which allow the flow of the blood from one or the other direction it's little um, tricky to understand which i'll probably show you in the next slide but let me illustrate it let, let me say it here itself that the blood in the foot <coughs> in the plantigrade foot actually flows from the deep veins foot is an arch to the superficial vein but from leg onwards and in the thigh it flows from superficial vein to deep vein and as you can see the direction of the valve is in this direction so the blood from the superficial vein flows in the deep veins if there is a deep vein thrombosis or if there is incompetence of the perforator or the valve here this vein will have more blood pressure that is venous hypertension this vein down the line will become leaky that is leaking vein and this vein will become more prominent and tortuous leading to what is called as a varicose vein so incompetence of the perforator leads to higher venous pressure in the great saphenous vein and its tributaries causing dilatation increasing further pressure resulting in other valves also failing and more and more vein branches become being varicose and this is exactly you can see here this is the usual venous anatomy of our foot this is the dorsal uh, venous arch on the dorsum of the foot which receives blood from the deep venous arch which is on the plantar surface of the foot and from here on the medial side medial to the great uh, to the medial malleolus the great saphenous vein takes the blood right up to the saphenofemoral junction which is and which is about 2.5 to 3 cm below and lateral to the pubic tubercle and there is a big valve there which can be seen by a color doppler study on the lateral side a short or a lesser saphenous vein takes the blood and drains it in the popliteal vein and the popliteal vein in turn in turn becomes the femoral vein and femoral vein above the inguinal canal uh, ligament is called the external artery once any where the system fails whether it be saphenop uh, uh, whether it is saphenop popliteal junction or at the level of the perforator or at the level of one of these valves here depending upon the duration the type of person the degree of failure the number of the veins getting affected you will get the symptoms and the visibility of tortuous veins so here is the anatomy again very clearly uh, depicted this is the dorsal uh, plantar deep plantar arch these are the digital veins these are the plantar veins and this is draining into the dorsal metatarsal veins and this is the great saphenous vein going to the uh, femoral vein once again i'm revising it and this is the short saphenous vein going into the small saphenous vein some people like to call it into the popliteal vein the deep vein on the anterior side is the anterior tibial vein on the posterior side is called the posterior tibial vein and this is also written here between the deep and the superficial system is the perforating vein so now what is the pathology of this condition and i like to call it physiopathology what physiology which we have been discussing so far gets altered to cause this Uh, problem primarily in most of the patients one may not be able to discern any major cause 
family history is somewhat positive. It is known to be running in family, but about good 80% of the patients do not have family history, do not tell you or bring you another member of the family, uh, a, 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 a kith and kin or a sibling. However, it's a good 10 to 15 to 20% subjects have a sibling suffering from the similar condition, maybe at the same time, maybe a few years down the line. So there is some predilection also present because pregnancy, advancing age, standing for long hours occur to almost all human beings, but not all suffer from varicose veins. So there has to be some predilection that it is more likely to be seen in those patient people who have some predisposition to this condition. Their valves are probably not that robust uh, made um, in the God's factory. And while they are pregnant, while they've got advanced age, while they're obese, they're standing for long hours, they develop this condition. However, there are also known secondary causes <clears throat> for this problem. Deep vein thrombosis. If there is a deep vein thrombosis, the, it, there will be a back pressure on the great saphenous vein. This problem, let me tell you, occurs almost universally, almost always in the lower extremity. It is a problem that the man pays the price of standing erect from being a quadruped. It rarely, rarely occurs in the upper extremity. If at all it is in the upper extremity, it is usually an arteriovenous malformation known as Parkes Weber syndrome, or it may be a hemangiomatous malformation known as Klippel Trunanes syndrome. In the lower extremity, other reasons for which it can develop, like pregnancy, is a or a pelvic mass. If there is a pelvic tumor, it will obviously have pressure on the deep veins, the external iliac vein, and the external iliac vein is a straight continuation of the femoral vein. Retroperitoneal fibrosis and some venous disease are also seen, uh, similar disease in people who are obese. The obesity epidemic is known to be kind of uh, the cause of the increase of this condition. Now everything we as clinicians tend to classify and grade this condition. And so we have done for the varicose vein or the venous insufficiency. This classification, which is most commonly accepted, there are two classifications that are in row, is known as CEAP classification. The CEAP is an acronym for etiology, A for anatomy, and P for pathology. And C stands for clinical. So it's a clinical, etiological, anatomical, and pathological classification. If you think it is congenital, presents since birth, or presents soon after birth, it's EC. If it is primary venous disease, it's EP. If it is secondary venous disorder, as I just illustrated in my last slide, it is EES. If still one cannot specify what the etiology is, you can still call it EN. If there is a venous reflux present, it is a P reflux present, venous obstruction is present, P pathology obstruction is present, Pathology not specified is PN. Anatomically, 90%, 99% it will be superficial veins. Rarely it will be deep veins, which is um, <coughs> acronymed as AD. Perforating veins, AP, and not specified as AN. So the CEAP classification that I just discussed is uh, summarized here. It ranges from C0 to C6. CEAP is clinical, etiological, anatomical, and pathophysiological. C0 is normal legs and feet. C1 is just the first stage of teeny weeny, spider, nevi, less than three millimeter, prominent veins, usually occurring near the ankle or anywhere in the leg. Uh, C2 is apparent varicosity, uh, prominent veins, bit tortuous, more or less tortuous, but patients having no edema or literally no symptoms, only prominent veins, and they may not like the look of it. C4 
is very close veins with trophic skin changes. If it is just pigmentation, purpura, eczema, it is called C4A. If there are more parchment-like skin changes, atrophy, blanchy, there is thinning of the, of the ankle, like an inverted champagne bottle, lipodermosclerosis, it is called, it is C4B. C5 is a healed venous ulcer, and C6 is active venous ulcer. So that's CEAP classification. These are normal legs or inferior extremity of the, the, <clears throat> the fairer sex and the men. Next slide. And we call it C0. These are some of my patients who have uh, various uh, forms of spider nevi. In fact, this is my own foot. And you can see little spider nevi developing here. This is the spider nevi developing in a foot with some, probably some amount of edema. This particular type and this particular configuration of spider nevi is like a crown and it's known as corona plebatica. And you can see a more spread and very clearly visible telangiectasia or spider nevi in C1 or all these are less than three millimeter of diameter and all these are mostly in the leg and the foot area. This is varicose vein, long, tortuous, prominent veins, more than three millimeter, with or without, mostly with, uh, in C2, when they do not have any other symptom of chronic venous insufficiency, we keep it a classification C2. In C3, gentlemen, Varicose veins have edema. This person has edema, but also you can see has changes in the nails. So nails are brittle and have lost luster. And there is some mottling and, uh, and uh, pigmentation of their skin, which I will show you more in the next slide. And once you come to the C4A, when there is skin changes and all shades of skin changes, basically the legs become ugly. There may be more purpura-like changes, mottling, eczema-like illness. This is all because of the small teeny weeny veins are leaking. The hemoglobin leaks out into the subcutaneous tissue. It is in the acidic lactic acid atmosphere, causes pain and is converted into hemosiderin, which is black in color. And this patchy mottled mosaic black coloration leads to eczema-like illness. A funny term, lipodermosclerosis. What it means is a change in the texture of the subcutaneous tissue. It is also means that there is, uh, if, you, if you press the place, there is, it looks like an atrophic skin. And the skin at the ankles, just above the, the, the malleoli, becomes thin. The whole leg becomes become thin. Some people have given it a simile of an inverted champagne bottle. And this particular condition is called lipodermosclerosis. When this venous return is hampered, there is severe uh, and there is uh, leakage of the hemosiderin pigment. There is severe deficiency of the uh, nutrients to the skin in this area and the subcutaneous skin, especially on the medial side of the leg, on the shin, on the medial malleolus gets necrosed and what you get is a condition known as venous ulcer. These venous ulcer can heal spontaneously if the person starts taking rest, start um, elevating the limbs, using some good dressing material, improving the foot hygiene. So all those things can lead to healed venous ulcer and we call it C5. Once the venous ulcer doesn't heal, it becomes non-healing ulcer and the patient comes to us with dirty granulation tissue, painful venous ulcer with changes of lipodermosclerosis, pigmentation. It's an active venous ulcer. Here also it is an active venous ulcer. However, a few days down the line after debridement and dressing, it is showing healthier granulation tissue. So this ulcer is undergoing treatment. However, it is under CAP classification of C6. It's an active venous ulcer. There's another classification known as Widmer's classification. Stage one, stage two, three A and B. Reversible edema, corona phlebatitica, Perimelular reticular veins is stage one. So this is a simpler classification. Persistent edema, hemosiderosis, purpura, mosaic skin, lipodermosclerosis, atrophy blanchies, stasis dermatitis is stage two. Leg ulcer, 
is it stage three? If it is healed, then three A, active leg ulcer, three B. You like this classification? Fair enough. It's simpler. It's just stage one, two, and three. So now, what are the symptoms of this condition? I think it's all well to known to all of us. It is the most of the symptoms are non-specific to any person uh, with uh, resting leg syndrome. Uh, but it's certainly, if you take good history, uh, you can probably differentiate it from claudication, which occurs in thromboenditis obliterans and which occurs in uh, uh, atherosclerotic disease, the diabetic foot or the atherosclerotic disease of the leg. Leg aches, tension in leg and feet, heaviness in legs, nocturnal leg cramps, rest leg leg syndrome, associated with itching, pruritus, skin changes. The leg pain is more common during the evening, especially after sessions of long standing. And there is dependent edema, which becomes apparent after long standing or at times when patients undertake long duration travel, bus travel, train travel or air travel. Skin changes, as I have already discussed, there is an ugly look to the leg, purpura-like changes, mottling, blackening, eczema. Ulcers can be non-healing. Ulcers are painful and infected, and there may be paresthesia. There is some association of this condition with, with people with who have profession of long-standing in obese subjects, people who have some family history, and in pregnancy. This I have already discussed. Next slide. Clinical symptoms occurs when the venous wall and the valves in the superficial leg veins are not working. And this is what leads to edema, leads to varicose eczema. At times, there is some kind of a thrombophlebitis and ulcers are typically found over the medial neoleolus. However, we have seen ulcers occurring elsewhere in the leg. So even on the lateral side, the ulcers do occur not infrequently. Difficult for blood to return to the heart from the legs leads to hemosiderin skin staining. Distal venous hypertension leads to lipodermosclerosis. Lipodermosclerosis has been defined as tapering of legs above ankles, changed texture of the subcutaneous tissue, and changed skin elasticity. The development of valvular incompetence and reflux results into atrophy, blanchy, and venous obstruction and uh, incompetent perforators lead to a condition known as saphna varix, where you find a lump of uh, veins that get together and kind of uh, shrivel up. So what are the risk factors of this condition? Advancing age, this condition certainly is more common as we age because of the laxity of the tissue and because of the overall burnt out or burnout of the valves in the veins. Family history of venous disease, prolonged standing, increased BMI, smoking, sedentary lifestyle, lower extremity trauma, prior attacks of venous thrombosis, arteriovenous shunts, high estrogen states, obesity, pregnancy, ligamentous laxity, laxity like hernia, flat feet, etc., are somewhat predisposing or risk factors to this condition. Biologists have done some studies on patients who have the syndrome of chronic venous insufficiency. And they have come out with a somewhat very, uh, uh, which looks uh, a bit a complicated uh, uh, cartoon, but it's not all that difficult either. Genetics, <coughs> pregnancy, uh, etc. As you can say, age, they cause venous hypertension. Vein walls become stretched. There's a stretch of the vasa visorum, which is the blood supply to the vein wall itself, which gets complex. And as you can say, vein wall relaxation, uh, relax blood stasis leads to venous hypertension. So this is the vicious cycle, the altered mechanomolecular mechano pathway and vein wall hypoxia is thus caused. So now once you have this altered mechanical and molecular pathways, what are these alterations? One is the VGF, the vasoendothelial growth factor, and HIF is increased, which is the transducing pathway. 
and the other um, <clears throat> protein um, um, markers, or I would say um, um, uh, <clears throat> intermediate um, communicators may be increased or decreased. They like selectin and VCAM and ROS may be increased and ENOS may be decreased. TGF, L, TGF beta, which is a pro-inflammatory cytokine and NF, MMPs may get increased. And these in turn go and work in the pathway on the target cell. And this target targets are written here. The targets um, may be the vasovasorum activation, PMN activation, or less elastin formation. And there is thus an altered function like venous hypoxia, inflammation in the vein wall, and remodeling may occur if this pathway is taken up and the vein may also get repaired. As you can see, there is some amount of um, uh, spontaneous ulcer healing. So this is the kind of way though, for those who are interested in molecular biology and pathophysiology of this condition, what molecular changes take place. One is not sure, certain whether these molecular changes in the various pathways are caused or the effect of this condition. But this is more of a mechanical disease rather than a disease or of an error of a metabolic phenomenon. It is more of a disease where anatomically the valves are not that robust at, as they should be and they become leaky. And um, if, in, if there isn't a secondary cause like deep vein thrombosis, it is primarily a disease that can be relegated to weak valves. So how do we diagnose this condition? History and clinical examination should usually suffice the diagnosis in majority of the subjects. And in many, many cases, for an experienced eye, <clears throat> it is a face value diagnosis. Uh, most of the patients, the moment they walk in, they open their mouth and they reveal their symptoms in first sentence, a watchful physician or a surgeon like uh, us looking at their legs is able to think and is able to almost say that this is my candidate for chronic venous insufficiency or venous hypertension. So what is the next investigation you do? Besides all your general investigations, investigations for comorbidities because you would like to look for any concomitant diabetes, hypertension, hypothyroidism, rheumatic diseases and other conditions and local general hygiene, feet, feet hygiene, um, the most specific investigation is a color Doppler or a Doppler scanning of the cephalofemoral valve of the deep veins and of the superficial veins and mostly of the perforators which connect the superficial vein and direct the blood from the superficial vein to the deep veins. Now this can be done by a formal uh, big size desk mounted uh, uh, color Doppler or it can be done by a handheld pocket ultrasound devices. And these are becoming fancy. And these are actually uh, like little stethoscopes for people who practice this um, uh, speciality um, more frequently and those who uh, uh, fashion themselves as vascular laboratories have these fancy handhold pocket ultrasounds. These are not very expensive, however, you need the same amount of licensing, uh, whether you use a desktop color Doppler or a handheld color Doppler. This color Doppler is diagnostic in many instances, except there have been instances where color Doppler has been diagnosed as normal, no incompetent perforator, no incompetence in the cephalofemoral junction. Yet as a clinician, I have said that, look, you have the spider nevi, you have prominent vein, you have symptoms, you have um, edema and there is mottling of the skin, there is some pigmentation of the skin. So clinically the veins are leaking, clinically the veins have hypertension. So despite, so I would say the sensitivity of this test and the specificity of the test is certainly above 90%, 95%, but in a small percentage of patients, you have to be wary and you have to convince your client that look, these Doppler tests are probably okay. However, you will be relieved by treatment. What are the other investigations? These are the investigations that are being described here, not to be condemned, but to be very sparingly used unless you are in a research situation or unless you are into a specific 
service a vascular service or there is some vested interest for you to perform these investigations i must confess that in my own practice i have never used these investigations these are to name these are ascending and descending venography varicography which is putting the dye in a varicose vein and taking a picture i don't know how it helps except that it does tell you that look these veins that maybe in a very obese subject where a, a dark skin subject where the varicose vein is not obvious on the surface and may be deeply buried into the fat vein i mean you and i always had an occasional patient where was it was even difficult to uh, look at the median cubital vein to take blood out and those are the subjects probably where if you can puncture a vein put a dye inside and take a photograph or a picture it would help you to anatomically delineate varicose veins venous pressure measurements can be done by the same similar transducer pattern put in the vein and magnetic resonance imaging putting a contrast that can also be done now let's come to the treatment this condition in the first two decades of my life i only knew the surgical treatment and the surgical treatment was a kandenberg's operation a kandenberg's operation involved ligation flush ligation of the saphenofemoral valve where to ligate it after the three tributaries the circumflex iliac the pudendal artery and the vein the circumflex femoral vein and the deep pudendal vein they join the the, the great saphenous vein and this is the cribriform fascia here is the femoral vein above the inguinal ligament the femoral vein becomes the external iliac vein and you do a flush ligation of the saphno femoral uh, uh, of the great saphenous vein you put a vein stripper which is a wire with a little stud here you put a vein stripper into the vein and you tie it down below you can put this stripper from above below or from below above and strip the whole vein out in the process while you're stripping it you tend to strip out many small tributaries and if there are any tributaries left you can individually pick those up by making small incisions in the leg and similar procedure can be done if the this the saphenous popliteal junction uh, of the lesser of the short saphenous vein or the lesser saphenous vein uh, is also required so it's a saphenous popliteal flush ligation and it is stripping an avulsion of the short saphenous system you can also do a ligation of the perforator it's a simple um, uh, task all you do is once you have done a um, a color doppler study and the saphno uh, femoral junction is uh, well competent and you do not really want to do a stripping uh, the flush ligation is stripping of the great saphenous vein then you have to like you have to locate and mark where the perforators are there are about three or four perforators uh, in the leg there is a clinical method of feeling these perforators known as figans perforator you take the pulp of your four finger and you run this four finger very smoothly on the surface of the vein where you look at the vein when the patient is comfortably lying on a couch and you, while you are running this you will suddenly feel it will dip and this dip is the place where the perforator is mark it inject local or in the spino axial anesthesia make an incision lift the vein there and you will see a perforator actually in front of you perforating through the deep fascia going into the deep vein the anterior tibial vein the posterior tibial vein or the popliteal vein you can clip this perforator ligate it and you can do it three or four times other tortuous veins in the leg can also be held between the tweeters and can literally be pulled out like you would pull out like um, um, like a crane would pull out a fish from the pond so this is called multiple phlebectomies ligation of the perforator so these are the surgical treatments that are, were done that are still being done and that has been the major way this condition is treated and probably today also this is the workhorse of the surgeon however there is a shifting paradigm and i am a witness to this shifting paradigm and my own practice has shifted in a very radical manner so much so in the last two years after i attended the first 
uh, Medicos Win meeting in Australia about two years ago in Melbourne, I have uh, literally done just a few cases, just a couple of cases of surgery, and most of it is what I'm doing today is known as sclerotherapy. There are brilliant sclerosins available now. To name the sclerosins from the undergraduate textbooks, those were boiling hot water, sodium morovate, phenol in almond oil, sodium tetradicyl sulfate, polydocanol. These can be used neat, 3% and foam. What I use in my practice, I used to use a lot of sodium tetradicyl sulfate available in India by the name of Cetrol. However, I switched to polydocanol, which is much um, um, more painless, and I dilute it further to 1.5% from 3% uh, with the objective to inject higher volume than higher concentration. Some people like to make a form of it, and I will not demonstrate how to make a form of it. There is a video of it, which you can very well see. And this is what you do. You can inject it using a cannula, like you do a cut open. You can put a cannula in one of the tortuous vein and gradually injecting and keep withdrawing the cannula. I use the technique using a, a insulin syringe, which has got a welded needle. And I did make multiple punctures at the site. And I keep the, the vein pressed with my uh, the, my assistant with the gauze piece keep the vein pressed for a, for about another 30 seconds and there goes the vein, it sclerosis and the relief is instant. Next day, if you call the patient, they come back and they say I have 60% relief. Uh, depending on the type of the patient, depending upon how far has this patient come to you from what distance, I give, I schedule them for second or the third or the fourth session. Usually I tell my patient that they will require six sessions three or four successive sessions at the interval of four to six weeks and two more sessions at the, after six months and a year. And they may require few smaller sessions down the line after a year or two. So don't promise too much, but the lesser you promise, the better they are. And in fact, whatever you promise, the amount of relief the patient come and tell you is far more because they've been suffering from a lot of pain, a lot of evening pain, a lot of tension in their legs, and it all goes away once there is no leakage, once uh, you have literally sealed, foamed, sclerosed the leaking vein. The same can be done by um, cyanoacrylate, the glue, uh, uh, what we call is an n cyanoacrylate uh, in venous ulcer. Uh, recently, I was reviewing a paper from Turkey where they have done uh, a, a duplex uh, procedure, and I think I've done it. I never reported it, though. Uh, I never thought it was worth reporting, but they have reported, and I've, uh, as an editor, I've accepted their paper. Where in a in a person in a, in those patients who have uh, an incompetent saphenofemoral valve, um, what they have done is rather than stripping the vein, they have gone and made a small incision and a flush ligation of the cephalofemoral junction, maybe and it can be done under local anesthesia, and then taking the cyanoacrylate acrylate, um, uh, glue, or you can take uh, uh, scleroform, you can take uh, polydocanol, and sclerose the rest of the veins in the thigh, in the leg, in the popliteal area, in the posterior leg, around the ulcer, and all this can be done. Now, whenever you have these little tricks, there always is a rich cousin. And the rich cousin of uh, cyanoacrylate and sclerotherapy is radiofrequency ablation and laser ablation. I will not speak much about it because I have lesser experience with these conditions. But what I believe and what in fact uh, is the truth that these also work the same way. It's your ability to locate, puncture, get inside the offending vein, in, get inside or near an offending uh, perforator, and you're able to, to ablate it or your, your ability to close it. What material you use, whether radio frequency, heat, laser, glue, foam, or polydocanol or sodium tetradicyl sulfate does not really matter. I think there has been no head-on trial, end-on between these 
vein closing or vein shutting down agents as to compare which one is better than the other. However, each one who is fond of using one of these will have its, his own claim. But uh, at the face value, if you look at it, most of these substances should uh, be working equally good or equally bad. And I think even in a head-on trial, if done properly, this, there will, this will be a trial of equivalence. What is more important is how you counsel this patient. What is even more important that if you tell your patients that it is the supportive treatment which is the mainstay of the treatment, avoiding long periods of standing. But this is an advice which is easier given than done. You cannot tell a person to change his location. You may at times the person may be ready and ask his boss or may give up a job or say, okay, fine, enough is enough. I can't have these leg aches. So whatever way you advise, but if the person has to stand for long hours, like most of, a uh, lot of my patients are shopkeepers, ask them to make a, a desk, take a stool, take a high chair, sit on a high chair, take a stool, pull a stool, put your leg on the stool and work on your desk. And, and, and you can make a contraption where you can sit um, elevate your legs, avoid sitting, sitting cross legs. You should uh, try and reduce body weight. You have a small walking program and compression therapy. Must you stand for long hours? Must you stand for long hours every day? Must you stand long hours while traveling or once in a while? If once in a while, it is best to use a compression bandage or a compression hosiery or a compression stocking and do it, especially if it is a winter season. The compression therapy, I will come to it in a minute. I will tell you it is again easier advice than it is complied upon. Now, what else is important is this micronized purified flavonoid fraction dressing. This is also a kind of a uh, material that helps to improve the texture of the skin that has been damaged by hemocytine pigmentation. Now let's come to compression therapy. A lot has been said about compression therapy. Many, many big uh, uh, business houses have come into compression therapy in many ways. A lot of research has been done. Physiotherapists have stepped in and uh, paramedics have stepped in. Four layer compression bandages are being described. Two layers where first layer is that of a, uh, of a kind of a padding which has no wires. And the second layer is a wired kind of a compression. With, you have this graded pneumatic compression where there is higher compression here, less higher here, less higher here, less higher here. And then this pump kind of is a programmed pump, then it releases the pressure here so that the edema is literally squeezed out into the pelvis and it goes up in the upper veins. You have this garment which is, uh, which is customized. Somebody will come. Uh, to your place or to your clinic, we'll take the measurements and we'll literally give you a customized garment. It has differential pressure uh, at this part in the foot, then at the ankle, then little less pressure here. So it is known as a thromboembolic embolic deterrent uh, hosiery or a hosiery with a differential pressure right from the ankle to the calf. And um, this is uh, also very effective if one has to stand for long hours. So what is the prevention of this kind of condition? This condition is showing some kind of uh, um, increase in incidence rate and that they say is because of the obesity in certain parts of the world. So obesity certainly is a harbinger of uh, varicose veins and venous insufficiency. So First of all, I would say weight control is a very important uh, measure to prevent this condition. Adequate physical exercise, avoidance of smoking and other forms of tobacco, avoiding sedentary activities, moving a lot of your toes, standing on your feet, standing on your toes, doing some kind of a uh, <clears throat> deep breathing exercise. And then I put it in red here, yoga. I don't like to call it yoga. But yoga is excellent because yoga teaches you to deep breathe. Once you deep breathe, there's the negative pressure created in the thoracic cavity 
and then there is a whole channel of the blood flowing right from your lower extremity, right from your toes, back into your superficial veins, back into the deep veins, from the deep veins to inferior vena cava to the right side of the heart. And if the right side of the heart is a good pre-fill, pre-load, then it will, by Starling's law, it will, con it will contract better and more oxygen will reach the feet and the pain will go away. So the more you deep breathe, we call it pranayama, um, and, and, and this condition is eminently relieved by deep breathing in yoga. Sitting habits, sitting cross-legged is bad. Uh, profession modification, if you have a profession where you have to stand for long hours, is uh, probably all right if this condition is really marring your quality of life. Control of hypertension is very, very important by usual antihypertensive drugs. So you have, one has to be sent to the physician or uh, we as surgeons may treat the hypertensions if you feel comfortable doing so. Uh, long hours of travel tips are given to these subjects to wear their compression um, garment or compression hosiery while they are traveling in long hours in aeroplanes and in buses or uh, they should keep on wriggling their toes, keep on uh, uh, standing up on their ankles, walking in the aisle of the aeroplane and doing some exercises, what we call as a uh, triceps suri exercises and quadriceps exercises. Compression bandage again is a very important method to prevent this condition. So in summary, friends, ladies and gentlemen, members of the Association of Surgeons of India, I hope um, I have been able to convey that venous disorders are acute thrombotic events, which was not the subject to the talk uh, this afternoon. Chronic stasis issues leading to venous hypertension. And what we have discussed are the leaking veins, which leads to plethora of changes in the skin and subcutaneous tissue, the condition known as varicose vein or superficial um, leaking veins or superficial uh, venous hypertension. So of the chronic disorder that we uh, dealt with are varicose veins, venous incompetence, which can occur rarely in the deep vein. In the deep vein, it occurs. It also leads to pelvic pain in young women. I have not dealt with this subject. It is very difficult to treat deep vein varicosity, deep vein hypertension. And this is a subject that we can take up some other time. It is a rarer condition as compared to superficial vein in, uh, venous incompetence. So primary varicose veins can be treated for almost cure by one of the techniques. The technique that is currently prevalent is that of sclerotherapy. Deep venous reflux is treated, but it is not quite curable. Varicosities are common symptoms of venous disease and are simply not cosmetic problems. And the patients, if you do a good quality of life analysis, they do suffer from a lot of subtle symptoms. And at times they have been said uh, by family physicians many a times that you have do not have any problem, especially if the color Doppler has been turned out to be normal and not showing any incompetent well. Regardless of treatment modality, recurrent rate can be high, but if treated properly, this recurrence can be prevented. Several sessions may be required. Good counseling is also a very important uh, part of the treatment. Thank you very much indeed. I'll be very happy to take any questions from you in the next uh, 20 or 30 minutes. Uh, wish you good luck and I wait here to uh, listen to your responses and any questions that you may have. Thank you very much indeed. Neela Kantam, and he says, what is the importance of spontaneous eco-contrast phenomenon in patients with varicose veins? I think um, it's a very relevant question, but it's primarily a question for um, uh, radiologists uh, uh, and maybe uh, people who are doing radiology themselves in the vascular unit. However, I could quickly look through this question and this actually is a 
kind of a trick or a technique that uh, people use, and it is because of the 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 cellular the swelling of the cellular component of the blood that one is able to kind of enhance or contrast the reflux. So it it's a trick that the sonologist uses to enhance the contrast to look at the reflux at the junction. Uh, uh, I'm uh, I may not be hundred percent correct because. Being a surgeon, I don't do ultrasound myself, but those who do ultrasound uh, should be more conversant with this question. Hello, uh, Lakshman. Lakshman, I'm online. You, want, you can ask a question, of course. This is Dr. Sastri from Hyderabad who's asking a question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Lakshman, do you have a question? Okay, my experience with recurrence uh, with radio frequency ablation is zero. I use uh, Sclerotherapy, chemical sclerotherapy. I was using 3% sodium tetradiesel sulfate. Now I am using 1.5% polydocanol. The ampule is 3% polydocanol. I further dilute it. And my strategy is to give more volume rather than more concentration so that the longer length of the vein can be infiltrated. Uh, because when I see RFA and when I see laser, you put a cannula inside the lay, uh, in the in the vein, and you gradually release it, uh, and you release the NDEAG laser or RFA. My guess to your uh, my straight answer to your question and my guess would be that the recurrence rate to laser, RFA, or sclerotherapy should be similar. It's only with what dexterity and how much effort you have taken to sclerose the small veins, the large veins. Uh, how effectively one has been able to enter the lumen of the vein and been able to do it, how deep in the subcutaneous tissue the vein is situated. As all of us know, I took that corollary. Sometimes it's very easy to draw blood from a median cubital vein and in another person it's a nightmare to even find a peripheral vein to draw blood for sampling. So people have hidden veins and people have overt looking veins. And same can be true for leaking veins. Same can be true for incompetent veins. Incompetent veins may be hidden in edema, in the color of the skin, in the subcutaneous tissue. The incompetent veins may be, may be very visible and very easily uh, uh, you can kind of enter the lumen of the vein. Which energy source you enter with, whether laser, RFA, or sclerotherapy, I don't think would matter. As I said, there has never been a head-on trial with these three different modalities of ablating the veins. My own guess is that all these procedures are not a single sitting procedure. Now, laser is an expensive tool. So I do sclerotherapy, say, four weekly or six weekly. So ultimately, if you give four or six kind of sessions and some veins remain leaking, so 10% of the symptoms or 20% of the symptoms remain. Whether you call it a recurrence or whether you call it a residual disease or whether you call it is the ultimate gain objective that was to be achieved from this kind of treatment. So I think we need to define the, the, the definition of the recurrence in this situation. It's not really the recurrence, it's the residual disease or it is too much expectation from the treatment. Did you get... Did you, Yes, Lakshman, go ahead. Hello. Yes, Lakshman. Uh, sir, if there are only isolated, isolated, point are incompetence, so what do you advise for them, sir? I advise do everything. I advise, there is a head-on trial, there is a trial published in the New England Journal of Medicine, very famous trial known as CHAP. There was a trial I was reading. If the cephanofemoral Val is grossly incompetent and there is reflux. There is no harm making a small transverse incision. All of us are surgeons. 
and ligating that where that that the great saphenous vein there above where it is joined by three other major tributaries as i just demonstrated in my talk and just um, sclerose the rest of the veins so it should be a combination of what, who stops you from doing a ses second session who stops you from giving injection into the other teeny weeny veins where you can enter the lumen if there is a incompetent large cephalo uh, femoral valve it, it 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 cannot be sclerosed it cannot be treated by laser you will enter the deep vein you will cause thrombosis in the deep vein it is best uh, ligated surgically No, no, no. I would. I uh, generally don't do uh, cephalofemoral junction ligation if there is no reflux. Uh, clinically, by doing the clinical examinations, well described in all our surgical textbooks, and radiologically nowadays, radiologists are pretty smart and they can give you the color Doppler uh, pictures are pretty accurate. They they weren't accurate, but by and by, when the radiologists have got better high resolution probes and they've got trained into vascular. um as it been means so they can able, they are able to do this and um, so for incompetent perforators uh, uh, saphenous popliteal incompetence and locally uh, deformed veins in the leg one doesn't need to ligate the saphenous femoral valve saphenous femoral junction thank you very much sir very lucid talk thank you very much thank you thank you dr sastri thank you Uh, dr kumar roshan uh, has asked a question uh, he says it's been excellent talk so thank you dr kumar roshan and he says can you show us incompetent popliteal vein surgery um i'm afraid i have never done incompetent popliteal vein surgery uh, i have uh, on a few occasions uh, done a flush ligation of a short saphenous vein popliteal vein junction Uh, tracing the short saphenous system back into the popliteal fossa but uh, if you mean by incompetent popliteal vein surgery then it's not a big deal all you have to do is if you have a tortuous vein on the lateral side of the leg and you can presume this to be the short saphenous vein and you can follow it uh, to the popliteal fossa and you can gradually dissect it like any other vessel you dissect and it is not very important to do a flush ligation in this case i mean if 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 you're a bit afraid to dig deep into the popliteal fossa you can and go right there at the popliteal vein which may be a little bit uh, uh, deep in you can just ligate the short saphenous vein as close as safely as you can uh, the flush ligation situation is in the in the long saphenous femoral vein junction because right at the junction three big veins as i said the circumflex iliac vein the inferior epigastric superficial inferior epigastric vein and the Uh, external pudendal vein these are the three veins joining and there may be other veins uh, which will lead to the back pressure and the leakage of the blood into the other veins so the flush ligation situation is with the saphenous femoral junction ligation but long short saphenous popliteal venous junction ligation can be done a little uh, about a centimeter maybe 15 mm uh, distal to the saphenous popliteal junction uh, thank you um, uh, thank you dr uh, kumar roshan dr shivaram you have asked me a question of radio frequency ablation and how it works i think uh, as i just explained to you in my slides and uh, i also answered dr sastri that uh, uh, radio frequency ablation uh, laser and chemical sclerosants they all work by obliterating the lumen of the leaking veins of the hypertensive veins of the varicose veins whichever word you like to get dr rohit sagu is asking a question any role of elastic stocking after surgery and for how much time uh, very good question use of uh, compression after surgery i think it is uh, 
a very good question i try to answer it but i know everything cannot be answered in the talk and that is why there is a question and answer session dr sago uh, elastic stockings alone there has been a head on trial published in the new england journal of medicine known as the chap trial where endovenous ablation compared with the compression hoisery and undoubtedly endovenous ablation was a winner but this was a multi center trial which was done in the british isles in several centers in the united kingdom a very tiny trial though and uh, the trial was headed by edinburgh hospital um, uh, in the cambridge university in united kingdom and there were 20 participants of this trial now your question is to use compression after surgery i think surgery can't achieve 100% the pre operative counseling is very important i sit and counsel my patients and i i am a good counselor i would tell them that look 20% of your symptoms will go away by your lifestyle changes by your ability to reduce your weight uh, change your sitting postures elevated sitting and definitely definitely using compression stockings when you're traveling long distances you're doing an air travel a bus travel and if you have a vocation or a profession where you have to stand for long hours if you can change it to a stool sitting and a desk writing position with the with the legs on the stool and if your boss permits it if your job permits it i have known people who have quit their jobs because they get so much leg pain because of this condition if you can't do that then do wear a compression stocking must you stand for long hours during hours now <clears throat> coming to your question directly use of compression stocking after surgery i think the answer comes from my previous description if again the sclerotherapy or surgery doesn't close all the superficial veins so surgery if you have promised don't promise uh, heaven after surgery surgery will achieve 40% 60% 80% control of symptoms after all what for has the patient come for it 1 to 2% 10% patient may come for the cosmetic problem of the the cosmetic reason for the of this problem 90% come because they have got swollen feet they are worried and they have got leg aches and they have got tired legs and at the end of the day they really fatigued they can't stand they say my my legs will uh, will drop cut will and i can't stand for long hours and i'm losing my job so if there is a reasonable uh, 60 80% so you have to ask learn to ask qol questions quality of life questions and say i say what do you do he says i'm a i'm a chart vendor i'm a tailor vendor and i can stand and sell my sabzi and my vegetables on my tailor for 8 hours 10 hours fine i mean it's got relief now there's no need for him but even though if you are on the safer side you can ask them to use compression stockings again compression stockings are expensive they get soiled it is ta it is a big task to put them on and take them off in a country like india where 6 to 8 months of the year are hot and sultry weather it is not an advice it is a kind of a western advice where people wear three layers of clothing any anyway. <coughs> so compression stocking is an advice better easier given than actually taken so all right um, and compression stocking should not be a remedy to a poor a poor ablation of the of the veins that can actually be achieved by good quality veiny puncture so compression stocking is not an ad, is not an adjunct it can be an add on it cannot be an adjunct to a poorly performed uh, endovenous ablation i hope i have made my question clear <laughs> Doctor Sago, if you can type that you've heard me, I'll be very grateful, Doctor Sago. Hello. Uh, is there any other question? Can any one of you see a question on the screen? On the screen that has been shared. Uh, 
Oh, there is another question. The question is again from uh, uh, Dr. Chandu Sagar Nilakantam. Um, it's a very good question. Uh, let me congratulate you from asking this question. Uh, I didn't cover this in my lecture. So it is, I would say, um, uh, a question that wasn't covered in that those 50 minutes of webinar I gave. Now, your question is, will varicose veins resurface after surgery? And I read it, I read it not, uh, not even after surgery, after endovenous ablation. Uh, my question, my answer is um, simple. If, if you have extirpated the vein, stripped the vein away, you've put in a venous, uh, you have done, uh, you put in a stripper wire and you've done a Trendelenburg operation, this particular vein which has been stripped away will not grow back. But what will happen? There are other tributaries which will get blood from some other vein um, from this um, uh, in the system because there are many unnamed superficial veins. Those may now resurface because this one has been stripped out. Again, to answer your question, there are two conditions that I illustrated. Uh, which is one is uh, uh, a, uh, is the syndrome. I'm just forgetting the name, and and the other one is actually venous malformation. <laughs> if you made a Clippel Trinali syndrome. If you made a, a mistaken diagnosis of this as a varicose vein, then if you go ahead and do an endovenous ablation, these veins for sure, because this is a major cavernous type of a venous congenital malformation, these veins would resurface. And if after surgery, a good, what you thought was a wonderful uh, procedure in one or two or three sittings of endovenous ablation, the, the veins have resurfaced, reappeared. I think you should start trying and considering and revising your diagnosis. It may be one of those Kripal syndrome or one of those um, uh, cavernous malformations. Now, resurfacing after endovenous ablation is certainly no. Ineffective endovenous ablation, too much diluted fluid, too less amount of the chemical inside, too large uh, a vein, a vein which has got uh, many tributaries, a vein which has got um, inco incompetent um, um, uh, perforators where the sclerosing agent has leaked into the leaked into the bigger stream of the deep vein. It didn't cause it. Uh, can certainly lead to resurfacing and you may have some amount of initial sclerosis and these veins may again open up. So I would say uh, that yes, uh, a lesser quality of endovenous ablation can uh, give rise to resurfacing of the vein. I hope I've answered your question. Hello. Is there any other question we can see? Uh, Dr. Anjali Dawle says need to focus on laser more. Um, Dr. Dawle, I'm not the best person and I must confess that uh, to ask more about laser. My own experience with laser is limited to what I have seen other people do in several conferences, meetings, and a couple of my friends whom I have watched over the shoulders while they have been doing the laser. Suresh, I'm going to talk about the webinar. It's very important. So, laser actually, again, is an energy source. And it is an energy source for endovenous ablation. What I'm going to say something may not make everybody happy. But my own impression, which I stand to be corrected at some other stage, that laser has no theoretical or demonstrated by randomized trial superiority against other modes of endovenous ablation. 
there and laser undoubtedly has a huge capital cost varying from 30 lakh rupees to 70 lakhs of rupees and a running cost because the laser fiber again costs around 18,000 rupees as I'm told it may have become cheaper. So naturally you pass on the capital cost and the running cost. But my own impression money. which I to the to the to the client or to the patient. So it's really achieving endovenous ablation by a more expensive method. Surely one would like to pay more money, but um, is it really superior? I don't know. My own impression is that it, it is a situation of equivalence between laser, RFA, radiofrequency ablation, and chemical endovenous ablation using polydocanol and 3% sodium tetradecyl sulfate. Other older uh, sclerosins like phenol and almond oil, boiling hot water, sodium maruate, those were not good sclerosins. Those were painful situations. So if you are thinking, if you are trying to compare the sclerosins of the 1960s and 1970s with the laser of the, of the 21st century, that is an unfair uh, 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 comparison. If you have to compare the laser of the 21st century, then you have to compare with the chemicals of the 21st century. Now there's another question. Uh, Dr. Anjali Davle, I don't know where are you from here, Dr. Anjali Davle, if you are hearing me. Uh, your question is, or your suggestion, your comment on the um, on the screen that I can see is surgeon should be more familiar with ultrasound Doppler than only laser or radio frequency can be done by proper training. Fully agree. Fully agree. There is no no uh, disagreement with this statement. Uh, uh, cardiologists became familiar with the echocardiography of in the third generation of cardiology. Um, gynecologists, I think the third generation of gynecologists, when I say third generation, I talk about 20th and 21st century. So third generation gynecologists have now are using photography and, uh, and, and, and sonography. Now first generation at the moment is using emergency medicine people are using FAST as a method of making focused assessment in emergency situations in the emergency departments um, uh, and using color Doppler and sonogram. Echocardiography in the intensive care unit is being used. However, use of color Doppler by general surgeons in the outpatient department as an office tool is still not uh, very commonly seen. It is now seen in the pockets or on the desks of people who are uh, fancy vascular surgeons, but I think as the cost of the equipment comes down, one more deterrent to using this particular technology is the PNDT Act. So I'm not here really to discuss that at the moment, but that certainly is a deterrent in a busy surgeon would say, why should I get myself into this uh, complication? And then you have to keep the mas machine in lock and key and then for an occasional patient to be, be more familiar. So I don't know who you are. I mean, are you a general surgeon with many other things, Dr. Damle? Or are you a radiologist who's asking this question? Because you've not disclosed your identity, Dr. Dowley. And if you are a general surgeon, a busy general surgical unit with uh, multitasking general surgery, I think I would uh, not be very happy taking a color Doppler in my own hand. And I would rather depend on my radiologist friend. However, if I do uh, branch out to do vascular surgery as my one and the only specialty, maybe certainly in my vascular laboratory, I would um, uh, try and acquire a color Doppler. So probably being a medical teacher and uh, 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 from the forum of the Association of Surgeons of India as an office bearer and a senior member of the surgical fraternity, my, and if I have to write an editorial on this in the Indian General Surgery, I would certainly not make it as a blunderbuss recommendation to general surgeons to have it because whatever we say here, people would write grant and ask their respective state governments to sanction that, that machine. 
So I don't think it really it really makes you um, 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 a very great or a very uh, skillful uh, achiever of the objective of the treatment of for the treatment of the varicose veins to have the color Doppler, but to be aware of the nuances of the color Dopplers and to be aware of how to interpret color Dopplers, that's not a big deal. I think all of us surgeons can very quickly learn it and we should know what means what. Thank you. I hope I've answered your question. Uh, what else is the question? Uh, Dr. Ashwarya has asked me a question. What is the role of calcium dobicillate in arresting the progress? Uh, Dr. Ashwarya Aris, uh, good question. Again, I must confess and acknowledge that um, drug treatment or medical treatment of chronic venous insufficiency. Um, oh, okay. Or uh, use of uh, 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 pills uh, for treating this condition. I did not go into detail, neither did I discuss this. Now, there are two prevalent drugs. Uh, that are available. One of which is the one you described is calcium dobicillate. The other is venosumin. Now, venosumin dose is 900 milligram BD or TDS and calcium dobicillate dose is 500 milligram twice or thrice a day. Now, my own uh, uh, confession do I prescribe these drugs? Yes, I do. Do I prescribe these drugs singly to cure the symptoms? I don't. Do I prescribe these drugs pre as an adjunct to endovenous ablation uh, and to give by some time uh, when the patient is preparing for a surgical or invasive procedure? My answer is yes. Does it help? My answer is more towards no. If you, on a one to 10 scale, a medical treatment with calcium dobicillate and medical treatment with this uh, condition, this uh, particular agent, uh, diosamin, uh, the drug is available in the trade name. Let me not take the trade name here, but let me <clears throat> say diosamin. These are endothelial stabilizing agents and the, uh, the new veins or the leaking veins uh, probably supposedly would have more stable repaired uh, endothelium and they would not leak as much is what the basis of these uh, pharmacological compounds are. Uh, I have not used an objective tool to assess the response like any other uh, general physician. I have done a sundry prescription of these agents. Um, I would acknowledge, I know many people are listening to me all over the world and in the SAR countries. So I have no shame in acknowledging that I have not um, thoroughly read a randomized trial uh, either on mild form uh, of uh, leaking veins and varicose veins and that's how effective these drugs are. I have read a randomized trial, uh, the CHAP trial on endovenous ablation compared to compression hosiery, but I am pretty sure that grossly leaking veins with venous ulcer, CEAP456, these particular pharmaceutical agents would have a little or no effect. Um, if you have a secondary question, I think we still have five, 10 minutes left. Please do ask me that question on a pharmaceutical agent, but I'm not very knowledgeable on this. Uh, I am well versed, conversant and experienced with endovenous ablation uh, and counseling and treating these patients, uh, having their long-term using it uh, quality of life assessment tool and of course the objective CEAP which all of us use which is a clinical tool now very much in the standard undergraduate textbooks the CEAP classification is there. 
but um, I would um, refrain from giving more, speaking more than that on pharmaceutical agents. Um, other supportive treatments, if people are having concomitant uh, resting leg syndrome, muscular cramps, pain due to ulcer, infection in the lower limb, use of diuretics. So I'm a great proponent of that for the treating comorbidity use. Hypothyroidism, you must treat. Uh, calcium, you must assess vitamin D3 deficiency, vitamin cyanocobalamin, vitamin B12 deficiencies in a majority vegetarian population that we cater to. These must be done. Dependent edema, a use of diuretics to relieve somewhat of dependent edema, relieving hypothyroidism, limb elevation, limb massage from below upwards, uh, intermittent compression, intermittent machine compression, uh, use of chloroquine for um, muscular cramps, using other uncertified uh, treatments of muscular cramps, which calcium dobicillate is one of which. L-carnitine is a very important treatment in a few of patients who used to have this resting leg syndrome. I have uh, prescribed weekly L-carnitine for three weeks, then switched them to oral L-carnitine. It helps a great deal, I must say. Uh, whether this has been a placebo effect or whatever, L-carnitine does help uh, warm surroundings, um, uh, leg and foot hygiene. So I'm a great proponent and I do spend a fair bit of my time in counseling these patients on all these aspects. In fact, um, in my own pharmacy, I would, uh, uh, I would ask them to buy a pumice stone to clean their leg and feet, uh, anoint their uh, leg with the nice uh, oily substances that are prevalent with the, with the smell that they like, um, use of large stockings, even if they are not compression stockings, as protective stockings, cotton stockings, especially in winter weather, and they, they're good. I mean, they're the nice things to do. Um, um, foot hygiene, uh, treat their hypocalcemia, treat their constipation of all of these. A lot of these patients are constipated. They would sit for long hours on a toilet seat and really, really straining of 40 minutes. So like 40 minutes, you sit on a toilet seat and strain, what are you doing to your veins? I mean, it is known that constipation is harbinger of a heart attack on the toilet seat. Constipation is a harbinger of bleeding from piles on a toilet seat. So does constipation would certainly have a deteriorating effect on your varicose veins. If you sit long on a toilet seat, keep on straining on a toilet seat. If you have an enlarged prostate and you are straining on the urinary strain, you for for, uh, for sure are straining on your veins and your veins are leaking and your veins are leaking, then hemoglobin is leaking, hemosiderin is there, lactic acid is there. If there is a local milieu lacteacidosis, it will be a painful limb and it will be a mottled limb where the hemoglobin has leaked. So uh, those are my take on those questions. Let me see if there are any more questions. <laughs> Let me see if there are any more questions. Uh, there is a question from Dr. Uh, Namrata Kulkarni, and it's a very good question. Uh, the question Dr. Kulkarni has asked, patients with only perforator incompetence, but junction, competent, but junction is competent, how to proceed? Uh, <clears throat> brilliant question. See, first thing I in my practice of vascular vein got friendly with a sonologist, with a color Doppler person. And I presented with him with his first indelible ink pen. I mean, they have, I mean I'm just saying it this way that it, it is important to ask the sonologist to, to mark out, to point out where the perforator is using his if you see this specialty is practiced by general surgeons and vascular surgeons. So you have to see the vascular surgeon needn't do this. I mean, he didn't really go and be friendly or bribe uh, 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 the sonologist to give him the location of the perforator in the same price, uh, but um, take some extra pains, go that extra mile to mark the perforator 
with an ink and then the patient walk back to your clinic and at that juncture before the, this marking gets obliterated or uh, this marking gets rubbed off you go and inject and obliterate or uh, do ablate that perforator there's a clinical method which i learned when i was an undergraduate and i give the credit of this to professor anurag shrivastava head of the department of surgery who has been he he uh, i would say my teacher uh, who gave me a lot of insight in the venous insufficiency disease and he taught me a method which has disappeared from the clinical med- the clinical uh, in the textbooks of the clinical methods it's called fegans method of locating a perforator what you do is you take the pulp of your your main finger if you're a left hander then your left finger your fourth finger and you you just run your finger on the vein or run it nicely with a very gentle uniform pressure and you will feel a dip close your eyes and you will feel a dip take your pen out mark this dip this is the dip where there is another vein going through the deep uh, aphasia into the deep vein mark it this is the perforator take an insulin syringe filled with a sclerosant agent pull the plunger you will say the blood will gush into it inject it and here you are you've closed the perforator sanjay 5 minute baad quick has baat 10 minute mein phone kar raha hu online baitha hu um let's see if there's any so if you have incompetent perforators with a competent cephalofemoral junction valve just deal with the perforators and deal with the the prominent veins deal with the veins around the ulcer deal and if you are not able to deal it in the first go call your patient after 4 weeks 6 weeks 8 weeks there's no there's no fixed regime call it's is the second call is a call of convenience he lives in a mohalla next to your clinic call him every week he lives 400 kilometers he's is happy to come 6 weeks call him in 6 weeks and just <clears throat> so it's a, it's the next appointment of convenience and then you inject the the remaining vein i mean you inject the perforator first you can do a self assessment mark it in your notes that i only injected the perforators and and see the effect and then you can actually objectivize this effect and say 40% 60% relief in symptoms 20% so like you do for any other clinical condition subjective relief objective relief so you can mark subjective and objective relief then for the remaining veins or the veins resurfacing reappearing don't don't you ever promise in any endovenous ablation surgery that all will go away or maximum will go away in the first sitting charge less charge repeatedly because every time patient in my private practice i charge less but i charge ultimately it's the same amount of money that has come to your pocket but it, each time you are gauging and each time patient is a happier paymaster because each time he's gaining and you didn't promise him uh, all the fruits on one day um, i mean fill his first basket of fruit and the second basket and the third basket and say it's a um, it's a polymorphic kind of a attainment not all in one go and that's the trick and that's why questions like resurfacing recurrence do not Uh, uh do not occur in this situation there will always be some residual disease and there will always be some achievement in each session of endovenous ablation that you will do is there any other question what is incompetent vein question by dr asif memam memam what is incompetent vein question by dr asif mehman wonderful question very basic question i'm glad somebody is asking this question what is an incompetent vein it's a functional incompetence it is not a morphological incompetence if you biopsy an incompetent vein and give it the test of the histomorphology cut the sections embed it in into paraffin section take it to your best pathologist take it to your best cytologist or immunohistochemistry there would be nothing wrong in the morbid and in the anatomy of the vein 
the, the type of endothelium, the type of perimedium uh, will be the same. So what is an incompetent vein? An incompetent vein is morphologically normal, but the graph morphology is altered. An incompetent vein below three millimeter and incompetent is known as telangiectasia. More than a millimeter and incompetent is varicose or prominent vein. So it's certainly dilated vein, more gross morphology, it's certainly tortuous vein, and it is a leaking vein. It is a vein where there is venous hypertension. If the normal blood pressure, if the normal endoluminal pressure is one millimeter of mercury in a superficial vein in a leg in standing position this becomes two or three millimeter or up to five millimeter of mercury so the condition is better termed as venous hypertension venous insufficiency incompetent vein in terms of its ability to push the blood towards the heart into the deep venous system it is a vein which is refluxing. It is a vein in which the blood from the deep vein is getting back into the system. It is an overfilled vein. It is an overwhelmed vein. It is a vein where from where the RBC is leaking. So those are my take on what is an incompetent vein. Is there any other question? Let's see. What is incompetent vein? Question by Dr. Excellent, sir. Excellent. Congress to Team ASA, Dr. Gunam, sir, and Dr. Anjali, sir, need to do. Um, Dr. Anjali Dowley has said it has been excellent and he she congratulates the team. So thank you, Dr. Anjali Dowley. I hope I answered your questions. Uh, I don't see any other question. Oh, there's another question from Deepesh Kumar. Dr. Deepesh Kumar, I'm reading his question first as I've been asked by the organizers to read the question aloud. Sir, you told about the flow of blood from deep to superficial <clears throat> and in the foot region and reverse in upper part. I need a detail about this. Okay, let me repeat it again. Our foot is an arched foot. We are plantigrade people. We are said to be descendants of ape, and apes only dance on the, on the hind feet, but they normally walk and climb the tree on their four feet. So there are certain prices like hernia, gallstone, and varicose vein and piles that we pay from becoming erect, from adopting the erect posture. And these have been there in the phylogeny. When you adopt the erect posture, the plantar arch has vein, and as you know, if you have dissected the plant, I have dissected the foot uh, very assiduously during my MBBS. There is a big plantar fascia and a plantar arch. Deep to the plantar arch is the deep uh, plantar uh, 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 venous arch. So when you walk the deep plantar, and man is walking all the time, man is standing, you are always swinging and springing on your foot. The foot is a spring. The God has provided you with a spring, with an arch on the medial side and the foot sitting on the, on the ground with the lateral side of the foot. So this blood pushes itself from the deep arch to the superficial ventral arch. Now this blood naturally comes to the great cephalus vein on the lateral side and the short cephalus vein on the medial side and, and the host of other veins which are going from below upwards. Now this blood is in the superficial vein. So above the malleoli, the medial malleoli and the lateral malleoli, there are perforators and this blood will go back into the deep vein with the popliteal vein, the anterior tibial vein, the posterior tibial vein in the leg, the popliteal vein in the knee joint and the femoral vein. And from there to the external iliac vein, the femoral vein becomes the external iliac vein. It is the external iliac vein. Just above the inguinal ligament, it's called the external iliac vein. So yes, the blood flows from deep vein, and it is an important MCQ question in the exam. Uh, in the primary of RCS exam, I was asked this question. And if you have read, and I, I learned this nicely from the last textbook of anatomy. Uh, if you've done a RCS, you know the last anatomy describes it very well. The, the blood from the deep vein flows into the superficial vein, 
only in the entire human body, only in the feet, only in the foot. So these are uh, and rest all over our all the body. Uh, it is it flows from superficial to the deep veins, and veins are disposed uh, just below the skin and below the muscle. The veins don't run on the external surface of the muscles. They don't. They run under on the under surface of the veins, and the veins also run as a vena communicantis alongside the artery, straddling the artery. So they uh, cheat. They, they they kind of get the the pulsation of the artery, and they kind of conduct the blood towards the heart. So that's my uh, answer. I, uh, I hope I've answered your question. Uh, uh, I have answered your question, Doctor. Uh, who was this asking this question? Deepesh. Any other question that I'm missing? Dr. Shivaram, radio frequency ablation, how it works. Uh, Rohit Sagu, I've answered this. Any role of elastic stockings after surgery? I've answered this question. Uh, oh, there are several more questions. Uh, Dr. Mahesh from Ahmedabad. Maximum, how much quantity you give in a single sitting at a single site for perforator incompetent varicose veins? The, the drug companies that produce, uh, there are not too many drug companies, I'm afraid. Uh, um, Samarth is the only drug company I know of, but I met a couple of uh, British companies and they said uh, Indian surgeons are yet to learn to do sclerotherapy and they said, we are planning to, in a big way, to come to India and take surgeons' old hands and teach them how to do sclerotherapy. And sclerotherapy has a huge, huge, huge market. And I, I do believe, I do believe that we are underusing endovenous ablation, and this modality has a huge, huge application. I was recently being the editor in chief of the Indian Journal of Surgery, seeing that uh, bosnic cyst in kidney, a thyroid cyst uh, are being cured using sclerosins. Hemorrhoids, I've used sclerosins all my life. Anal fistula. So there are many, many other, uh, 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 many, many other uh, 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 indications of using sclerotherapy. The agents, the, how much quantity do I use? Two or three ampules at a given time, that too diluted. I'm always sure that it doesn't enter the deep vein. It remains in the superficial vein. So I try and compress the proximal end of the vein so that it remains there. I see that the agent that goes into the lumen holds in there for 20, 30 seconds for its effect to happen. But I am not aware of the experimental evidence of how long, how much it should be there. I think it is a great idea to study it experimentally, that how much amount, what concentration, for how long does the chemical need to stay inside the lucy to, to achieve a kind of a, um, ideal occlusion of the venous lumen. So that's the answer to the question that uh, what quantity should we use uh, of the of the sclerosin? That was the question from a single sitting, two to three ampules, specially diluted. Uh, two, three years ago, I was using 3% sodium tetradecyl sulfate. I've been using foam. Uh, foam, I think you can use much more amount because it's much safer to use foam. Uh, two to three ampules is the maximum I've used in a single sitting, but I'm not aware if it is written somewhere. I have a question from Dr. Amit Shirvasto in Agra. Uh, Dr. Amit Shirvasto is a very senior surgeon in Agra uh, and very active in the Association of Surgeons of India. And he asked, is there any role of medical management like calcium dobisiloid and how does it work? As I said, Amit, um, maybe in very initial stages of telangiectasia, when the varicosity is less than three millimeter and there are visible veins, um, um, uh, what do we call this, corona, huh? corona phlebatica, uh, telangiectasia, uh, some mild amount of uh, pedal edema, Maybe these drugs are helpful, but one has never done drugs alone without compression. 
and without. I mean, you can't give calcium dobicilate and not treat hypothyroidism, not treat constipation, not treat long hours of cross limb sitting, not treat people not doing exercise, not treat their sedentary habits, not treat their obesity. So how effective drug per se alone is and what is the tool to assess? So these are kind of like anybody coming and saying, uh, take my drug also, but don't discontinue your uh, uh, anti-diabetic treatment that the Angrezi Dawa is being given. And uh, you are there on the, on the television all through the night that, and you're piggybacking your treatment on a, putting it as a piggyback on another main line proven treatment. So it's it's like, I mean, I think the most of what will work is weight reduction. What will work is actually a habit change is not sitting cross-legged, sitting with a stool on, using compression devices, yoga of all, day breathing exercises. On the top of it, if you add calcium dobicillate, um, it will appear to be working, but is it working? Will it stand the chance? I mean, is it like... Uh, anti-diabetic drug where you do anything, any amount of exercise, your blood sugar is high, you take some anti-diabetic pill, the blood sugar will come down. I mean, is the drug like that? Has it got that kind of an objective measurement for us? So there is no objectivity to, the, to measuring the, 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 the problem this causes. So I don't know really, and nobody, I don't think anybody knows, and neither, neither do I, I, I did confess that I have not read a trial, but I will locate for the trial again, but I don't think there, ever these drug companies have come up and shown us a randomized trial where these drugs have been used as one and the only modality of treatment against another proven modality treatment or done a trial of equivalence or a trial of superiority, I have not seen. If you, if anybody is aware of it, I would be very happy to read. Any other question? Are there more questions? How to proceed with only perforated incompetence, the junction of competence? I've seen this question. Oh, there's a question from Dr. Somnath Ghosh, follow-up result of your long experience. Thank you, Dr. Somnath Ghosh. Um, uh, uh, can I, can I, what's it? Can I get my file? That file is from patient, patient's not coming. I started, uh, I don't have a random, I've never done a randomized trial, but uh, <clears throat> being uh, epidemiologically, uh, aware I would, and educated, I like to uh, speak less on anecdotes. I like to speak less on impressions and on personal biases. So what I do that I can't do trial for everything in life. So I create my little tools. So I don't know if it is visible to the audience. I created a tool with CEAP scoring and a single page tool, and this is what have I done in my life for four or five more conditions that I have interest in treating. And then this shows that uh, first visit, second, and in the, in the columns, there's first, second, third, fourth visit, and the number of patients. And then I can quickly flip across because this is as yet an unanalyzed data. I think there are about uh, 120 patients, and I started making this record of my patients. Um, as long ago, can you help us, Usha, since when are we doing this record? Um, I think two years now. It's about two years. So two years, and I don't, I, I can see horizontally <clears throat> not a single failure in these 120 patients. And they've all come back, uh, very few for fallouts. And there is a gradual response. Now let's look at this one. First response is your greatest response, 60%, 40%. My itching is gone, redness is gone. Third visit, uh, my ulcer is healed. Uh, leg ache gone in two, two sittings. So long-term results to summarize uh, you know, my answer with endovenous ablation using single modality treatment, chemical endovenous ablation, insulin needle, multiple puncture, multiple times, 
like flush ligating and incompetent cephalofemoral valve if it is grossly incompetent and injecting both the perforators and the teeny weeny veins and the large veins on multiple settings i think there is always a success it is it is another matter whether the success is 80% 70% 60% in terms of relief of symptoms those are uh, ulcer healing pain edema itching redness and those you can create a scale on a subjective assessment and on an objective assessment uh, legs do become more beautiful the ugly blackening and mottling and mosaic coloration does disappear it gets scavenged away by the body's own defense mechanisms the skin texture becomes easier the lipodermosclerosis improves ulcer heals and patients uh, uh, quality of life improvement is there they they get back to work they get back to travel they get back to tourism so uh, those is that is my take on it i may be biased in what i'm saying but um, uh, i have a growing uh, clientele for this condition uh, so certainly uh, long term results of uh, and i have no nothing to uh, uh, theoretically to suspect that on longer basis beyond 2 years and 5 years these this problem would resurface why would it if the deep vein is uh, nicely competent if the leaking veins have been ablated why would the problem resurface and if it does i mean there's nothing harm two three years down the line three years down the line five years down the line if there are few more veins which have become more uh, prominent which have become more uh, leaky which have become more proud Uh, you can kind of rejab them and take take an insulin serine. What does it come? I mean, yeah, even if the patient is a complaining patient, do it free of charge. It doesn't cost you much. I mean, you can again uh, kind of take take the syringe and uh, do an endovenous ablation. So uh, that is, I think, it's a very safe procedure. It's uh, with polydocanol. It has become painless procedure. So I did lose. I I did lose. Uh, lost my own Marcy who. Who was very happy with the? I I didn't know I didn't know how to make uh, foam at that time. Ten twelve years ago, she came to me from Calcutta, and I injected neat uh, uh, setrol, which is uh, <clears throat> which on those days it was imported. Thrombovar was available. It was awfully painful for us, uh, for her, and she never came back to me. She said that is a very painful procedure, and I didn't use insulin syringe at that time. So, uh, but she did get. immense relief i mean she does say whenever i go and visit her in kolkata I mean, it's an anecdote of course but it's an important anecdote and it has a, whenever i go and visit her back in kolkata she says well it has given her tremendous relief from the problem but the experience of the treatment was not good but now with the use of insulin serin uh, change of chemical from 3% sodium tetradiesel sulfate to polydocanol that too now diluted to 1.5% which is more or less a painless injection i think the patient's experience is a more comfortable um, experience so uh, it's a winner on both sides uh, thank you namrata for thanking us uh, somnath ghosh i think i have answered your question on uh, our long term results amit i have answered your question um please do ask me questions if uh, the organizers are allowing us more time i'm not sure uh, how much time how much time are we left with what's the time by the clock 5 minutes so the allotted time is up until 5 o'clock so i think we've got another 5 minutes so uh, i think it has been a long session so some of you you still hook to your mobile phone or television set and you're still keen on the subject and there's more in your mind do i'm here in the, another 5 minutes because that's the that's the allotted time that i have to be here as a speaker but um, um maybe you have left uh, maybe some of you have left so if there is another question i'll be happy to take it well uh, let me thank you all who have thanked me on my whatsapp and my mobile Uh, many of you let me take your names somnath ghosh namrata kulkarni um ah there's another question 
unanswered. How to manage varicose vein in combination with deep vein thrombosis and some details about uh, tuminescence anesthesia. A tuminescence anesthesia is not needed um, in, the in the method that I have been using, 1.5% uh, colidocanol, insulin syringe, multiple puncha. It's done painlessly. I just uh, uh, can give one uh, um, uh, uh, mouth dissolving an SAID, uh, and that too is required by very few patients. But certainly for uh, um, endovenous catheterization for putting the laser uh, um, cathode or anode or laser uh, fiber, whatever you call it, the laser fiber inside the vein, tuminescence anesthesia is important. Uh, no personal experience, I've only seen it. Uh, I've, I have seen it being done in, in workshops. I've never seen it in practice. Uh, in a colleague's nursing home or a colleague's hospital. Um, the other is a tricky question, how to manage varicose veins in the presence of deep vein thrombosis. There's a short answer to that. And the short answer to that is, let the person, and it's a bad answer. Uh, let me give you a better answer. Uh, don't do anything to superficial veins. You will be in the court. Uh, what I was going to say, which I, uh, decided not to say as my first sentence, I'll say, let the person suffer from the symptoms of superficial vein thrombosis or superficial vein incompetence. The symptoms of deep vein thrombosis are far, far greater to bother you to treat the symptoms of superficial venous incompetence. So the answer to your question is deep treat the deep vein thrombosis. And deep vein thrombosis is one condition which is a precursor of superficial vein incompetence in 10, 20%. But the good news is that 90 to 95% of the subjects, if treated early, recognize early, treated well with modern antiplatelet treatment, with thromboembectomy, with limb elevation, appropriate antibiotics, <laughs> Uh, good rheology uh, treatment, uh, treating it in uh, tandem with colleagues who are more proficient with anticoagulant therapy, there is usually complete resolution of any thrombus in the deep veins. And if you take away the, the high risk factors of the deep vein thrombosis with the obesity, pelvic tumor, cancer in the body, a bad sleeping posture, uh, pelvic vein thrombosis, uh, uh, hyperestrogenic states, uh, then you can probably at a later stage when you're sure that the risk factors for deep vein thrombosis have, uh, are at a low ebb and the deep vein thrombosis has resolved completely, you may undertake the treatment of superficial venous incompetence. But Pari pasu with the deep vein thrombosis do not treat superficial vein incompetence. Uh, you should always refrain from doing that. I hope I've answered your question. But a very uh, tricky question. I must congratulate you from, for asking this question from me and a difficult question. But I think uh, I've tried and answered it to you. And uh, I'm sure the, there must be many experts sitting here who would be assessing uh, what I'm saying. They may, there may be some disagreements, uh, which is all right. I mean, there are disagreements always uh, uh, in the medical world and we, we take it with, uh, in, in good humor. But uh, that's my take on it. And uh, I think um, I would uh, remain to be enlightened by other friends through this medium only. You can straight away type your disagreement also. You don't need, need not be in a question answer mode. Uh, I may not be the expert. You may have a different opinion. So feel free to type your disagreement and I would try and take that on as well. We can take it as a debate also rather than a question and answer session. So thank you very much. I think the time is running out. But if you do have a quickie, then go ahead. Because till they switch off, I'm not going to get up and go away unless I get too tired. I am tired. It's over a year, an hour I've been talking, but uh, <clears throat> certainly I'm there. But that's what I'm committed to do today.
So the person who asked this question was um, Chandra Varman Singh. Chandra Varman Singh. I don't know where are you, Dr. Chandra Varman Singh. I, want, I think I've answered your question. Don't treat <clears throat> superficial vein incompetence in the presence of deep vein thrombosis. Prioritize the treatment of deep vein thrombosis. Once you achieve complete control of deep vein thrombosis, you have radiological evidence that deep vein thrombosis is not there even in the minuscule amount then go ahead and treat the superficial vein incompetence. That probably is not. Okay, hello audience. Uh, I have another instruction uh, to follow, which is from Dr. H.V. Shivaram, Shivaram, who's our um, uh, website in charge for the Association of Surgeons of India. And um, what I have to say is that um, the uh, announce the next webinar, uh, of the association and the next webinar of the association as you know we have every third wednesday of every month so if wednesday 15th of april again between 3 p.m to 5 p.m let me remind you uh, the webcast will start exactly at 15 hours that is 3 p.m it may last 40 minutes 50 minutes one hour depending on the speaker and rest of the time till five o'clock. So it's a two and a half, two hours interactive session between us surgeons and our brother and surgeons in the SAR countries from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. The topic for the next webinar on 15th of April is, and it's a very important topic. We all deal with this condition. Uh, it's a common day-to-day -day problem, interventions in acute pancreatitis. So we would all welcome our friend, Dr. G.V. Rao, a very famous uh, gastrointestinal surgeon from Asian Hospital in Hyderabad, who would be talking, I repeat, once again on interventions in acute pancreatitis, Wednesday, April the 15th. With this, I close. Thank you very much, friends. Thank you.